here today to give a historical retrospective of electronic information systems. My name is Edward Johnson, aka Eddie, and I'm the president of InfoEd International. I'm here today with Pat Johnson. Pat Johnson was the vice president for sponsored programs of the Research Foundation of the State University of New York. She retired back in 2006 after a 40-year career in electronic research administration. How are you today, Pat? I'm fine, thank you, Eddie. Nice to be here. Now, I know, you know, A21 has been an evolving mechanism, and I still, it it basically is. What have been your experiences of that over time? Interpretation. You know, federal rules aren't written for everyone, you know, like dummies to read. They were tightly worded, worked on over the years, and so a lot like the IRS tax code, when you keep building on the initial document, it becomes harder and harder and harder to interpret. That in itself becomes a burden to some because, you know, understanding what they mean with time and effort reporting, we've engaged in lots of discussions about, you know, the exact meaning of how things need to be documented. And still to this day, I'm sure there is disagreement on what's required. And I'm I'm assuming with all regulations, they tend to get larger, not smaller. So they start out with something that might almost be manageable except for the newness of it, then as time goes on, they're just expanding, expanding it, whether to iron out some of the ambiguity or just to introduce new regulations. I can remember in probably 2004, 2005, we were working with the government officials responsible for A21 in trying to clear up some of the issue with time and effort reporting. And we spent hours over single words. That's how incredibly difficult it was for the government to be assured that they were not losing accountability and for the universities on the other side to say this is not doing you any good you know we're trying to get to a point where the time and effort reporting was a valuable tool and you know that it was a struggle what um what did you see with uh, a133 did you get involved in that at all? Not much. That's the audit circular. Right. Yeah, no. Other than, you know, audits in themselves, we felt were, you know, major audits by the, the government didn't really cause us much concern because we had a huge internal audit staff. So we did a lot of auditing ourselves. So we felt, you know, when the A133 auditors came in, it, we were always given a pretty clean so bill of health. So it sounded like you proactively were doing a lot of auditing that the A133 would have kind of mandated or at least defined guidelines for the kinds of things you should be keeping track of in the event somebody knocks at your door. That's true. That's true. Then I believe when you were hired back in 2006, grants.gov was just starting to get traction into the electronic submission area. I believe their first mandatory submissions came out in, I think it was June of 2006, with the combination of Adobe Pure Edge forms. And did you... I mean, that was right as you, I believe. No, because again, out. the central office wasn't processing applications, you know, ourselves. It was at each campus. But as far as I know, our responsibility was to make sure each campus office was prepared to do this, had sufficient computing power and knowledge. Right. Because those applications, especially to the NIH, they can be quite large. These are, even mm-hmm. in paper, managing that is different. But now I know a lot of our clients had issues with storage because these things were massive, especially when you started including large images and other things. And so they were running out of space. And there wasn't an easy way to actually even administer those because you couldn't flow them around an email. You had to work off like a file system or something to keep those out there. Yeah, and it also required individual offices to be much more prepared with their computer technology. And, you know, that's a that's a costly effort on the part of of universities, because these offices were usually very small. I'm I'm wondering too, and we have this problem now with a lot of clients, if it made the deadlines even worse. Because before you had kind of the concept of mail, so you knew that you had to get it in mail by a certain time to get it in. Now the deadlines are like at five o'clock. And so you probably have investigators thinking, well, if I get it to them by lunchtime, right? I mean, I don't know. Well, not only that, but then what about a system that goes down? You know, or I know in the initial uh, fast lane, the system crashed because there was just way too much activity the final hours of any submission, and they couldn't handle it. 
I remember that too because when Fastlane first came out, it was not mandatory. And then I remember when they pulled the trigger in October, the thing went down in flames. And because it never experienced that load. And I don't know specifically what the statistics were, but it was like 5% of the utilization was occurring before they mandated it. And then once they mandated it, they just had this tidal wave of things that they just couldn't absorb. Well, I remember deadlines being extended simply because you could not get access to the system to load your proposal. So. We had the same thing when the S2S firm came out and they were extended or you had the right letters basically and a cover page, if you will, saying why this was late. And you could say, because grants.gov crashed. Yeah. So, yeah. so it was a new world, but again, things were, the burden was being shifted to, to the faculty. I mean, it was their responsibility to get the document prepared. And, you know, like anybody else, you like to wait till the last minute. And well, now the last minute was very dangerous. Right. Exactly. So I want to thank you for taking the time to go over this today. It's been a very interesting trek over your 40 years and how ERA has evolved over. So thanks again. You're welcome.